Is it? And now? Good. Good. Is it? Good afternoon and welcome to the COVID-19 Communication Center once more. My name is Emma Tia Phyllis and I'll be guiding the proceedings this afternoon as we give you another live broadcast as an update to COVID-19 in Namib.
pandemic in Namibia and what new developments might have come up this afternoon. So joining us today, we'll be having some statements or hearing some statements from Dr. Pea Mushelenga, the Minister of ICT, as well as joined by the DM of Ministry of Health and Social Services, Ms. Esther Mwinyangwe, as well as the NIP Acting CEO, Dr. David Uirap. I'd uh, just like to remind those of us who are here at the center that this is a live broadcast, therefore we need to minimize um, any noise or movement, but also any questions from the media after the three panelists have given their statements will be done at the podium um, and uh, using the mic to allow those viewers at home that are joining us live from the different live streaming platforms to be able to hear our questions and the responses by the panelists. So without wasting any time, I'd like to invite Dr. Pea Mushelenga to give us um, his sentiments so far on uh, COVID-19 in the country. Thank you very much, honorable dear fellows. Yeah. Today, I went to assess the situation in Commerce region, in Windhoek in particular, as well as around the areas of Okahanja just to see how people are complying and I can see all the market areas have been closed people are complying with the regulations and there are however problems at the roadblocks as people are trying to make shortcuts in order to leave the lockdown areas. I would like to appeal to the public to cooperate with the authorities and abide by the regulations. For example, at the roadblock, leaving Okahanja, going to Swakopmund, someone came there claiming he has been called by his employer to go, but he has a letter from that company saying it was sent to him yesterday. But the date stamp is about a week or a week and a half ago. This obviously shows that it's just people trying to make shortcuts to go through, and he was returned because those people in the roadblocks who look at details meticulously in order to ensure that the regulations are complied with. There is also an issue of people going to the funeral. What the public need to know is that regulations have stipulated that funerals are not to be attended by more than 10 persons. So when you go to a roadblock and you are more than 10 persons going to the same funeral, you will not be allowed to proceed as only some people could proceed, less than 10 people. Also, the other problem was with the number of people in the vehicles. It was clearly spelled out in the regulations that for the five-seaters vehicles, now you all only expected to have three passengers. Or for a seven-seater vehicle, you are only expected to have four passengers. The moment you exceed that number of persons, you will not be allowed to proceed from the checkpoint. Also, when you are going to a funeral, you will be required to provide a death certificate of the deceased to whose funeral you are going to. If you come there and you are six in a bigger vehicle, in a larger vehicle, and you proceed, and maybe three other people came later, so the officers will cross-check. And now they will add this number of three persons to already six persons that have proceeded, then they will record that nine people have gone to the funeral of X. Now, if three more persons come, 
Only one of them will be allowed because nine have already proceeded and it's only one person who will be added to proceed. So the public should be aware of that. And when people return from the funerals, now the permits that they were given to go with the funeral, they have to surrender it at the checkpoint. Otherwise, if they proceed with that permit, they will again use it to go back. So that is what our public should know. And we call upon our public to cooperate with the authorities so that together we can fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Very much, uh, Honourable Minister, for that. Um, I think the message is clear. Now I hand over to Dr. Deputy Minister of Ministry of Health and Social Services, Minyangwe, to give us her statement from the Ministry of Health on any new developments or information to the public from the Ministry of Health side. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. And um, a very warm Hello to the viewers and listeners out there. First of all, I would like to emphasize that the, ministry, the government of the Republic of Namibia is committed to support and protect the health of the Namibians. This is at the, hand, at the center of all our efforts to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also, and I have to emphasize that, that it is our responsibility, all of us, to adhere to the instituted measure to prevent the spread and also to cut the transmission chain of COVID-19. And when I talk about transmission, I want to emphasize the prevention of community transmission. The Ministry of Health and Social Services, of course, is committed and we will continue to update the community at large on how things are progressing. As we heard yesterday from the Minister, Dr. Kalumbi Shangula, we know that at the moment we have one case in Karas we have four cases in Erongo region and nine cases in Comas. So in total, we have uh, 14 confirmed cases. And I want to make use of this opportunity as well to commend and appreciate our health professionals for the good work that they are doing, for detecting, treating and caring for our COVID-19 patients. Equally, the appreciation is also going to our other health professionals, such as the social workers and psychologists who are also providing um, psychosocial support and counseling, because counseling and psychosocial support are very important ingredients or components of the continuum of holistic care. Now, um, I'm happy that we have Dr. Uirap with us, so I'm not going to talk about the, the samples that were taken. I'm sure he will dwell into that. But I want to mention that um, case number 14 uh, is, not, uh, is qualified as a, or we are classified as a not as a community trans transmission, but uh, as a, as a, what is it? Um, local, yeah, local transmission. Because this is a health worker who was in contact with um, uh, a COVID-19 uh, case. So, and that is, that is not strange because globally we know that, or it is, it has been attested that the frontline workers are at a very high risk because when people are presenting themselves at the health facility, one will never know whether the person is infected or not. So that is the case that we have, but uh, the person is in very stable condition. 
And uh, the message that I also want to send out is to our health sector fraternity. For the employers to make sure that our health workers are well protected and taken care of. Not only by providing personal protective um, equipment, but also make sure that they know and they are trained on how to use these uh, PPEs correctly. And uh, equally to our health workers, I want to caution them that it's now time for them also to take um, extra precautions and treat each patient as a high risk. We are thankful to all the sectors of the government that are really taking hands to fight the pandemic that we find ourselves in. We are also equally very thankful to all the um, business and private sectors who are coming on board. Any contribution that they are making is, is highly appreciated. And of course, to remind the viewers and the listeners out there that it is very, very important, and my minister also you know, alluded to that, to take and adhere to the um, rules that were set out, because we still hear that uh, in some regions for people it's like, it's business as usual. So we want to, to appeal to the community out there that this is serious, it's, it's real, it's the reality that we have at the moment, and people should try to adhere to all the you know, uh, measures, trying to wash their hands, not only wash, but you know, using water and run, running water and soap to wash their hands, and also avoid touching their noses, the eyes and nose and so on. So, and um, for anyone out there who might, you know, be concerned that they might have the signs of the COVID-19, we have our toll-free hotline number, which I think by now everyone should know it by head, 0800 800, uh, 0800 100 100 and if they are concerned and they have any concerns, they are free to call the, this number because it is 24-7 operational. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DM, for that update. I think at this point um, we um, understand uh, to some extent the, the role that our health professionals are, are playing to ensure that um, everyone who needs to prevent um, contracting the virus, but also to be more vigilant around ensuring that they do not spread it should they contract it, because that's the only way we can truly beat this coronavirus. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, as you might be aware, viewers, yesterday there was a lot of questions around testing, um, testing kits, around the process of, of um, how many tests have been done, uh, how many suspected cases we might have, and anything around really uh, identifying who might have the, the, the virus or who might not. And that is why we are joined today by the NIP acting CEO, Dr. David Uirap, to give us a holistic view around um, testing um, in the country and um, how they are complementing the efforts of government to ensure that um, we are able to to, to arrest uh, COVID-19 should it pop up in any of our citizens as soon as possible. Dr. Uirap, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, Deputy Minister. And uh, good afternoon to the journalists and to the viewing public. Um, first of all, perhaps to say, the Namibia Institute of Pathology, when it was established, about 20 years ago, was established specifically to um, provide laboratory support services to the public sector as we do now, but also to the private sector. As a, as a, as a public enterprise, and specifically in times of public health emergencies like we have now, NIP's role is meant to supplement what uh, the Ministry of Health and Social Services is doing to make sure that um, whatever outbreak we have is nipped in the bud at the earliest uh, opportunity. Now, initially when COVID-19 
uh, broke out in the world and when we started talking about getting ready to, to test. NIP was sending samples that were then collected to South Africa to our sisterly laboratory organization called the NICD, which is also the WHO reference laboratory for Southern Africa. But at the same time, we started preparing so that we could test for COVID-19 within the country. In this regard, we would like to thank the Ministry of Health and Social Services very much because with their assistance and the assistance of the World Health Organization and the CDC, plus also the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, we were, we were then able to set up the capacity to test uh, within, within NIP. And this we have been doing for the last month or so. Um, the testing, as you have previously heard, is based on what is called um, molecular technology, specifically uh, the PCR technology. And that is what we are using. This is the gold standard of testing for the coronavirus um, that is used everywhere in the world. Um, you would have heard that there is an international scarcity of the reagents that need to be used to test for the virus. And that is also the same problem that NIP has faced. Um, fortunately, we have been able to get the necessary supplies and we continue to test all those that have been submitted to us so far are being tested. We can say that and we have been able to do that specimen or samples that are submitted to us, we've been able to release them, um, if not on the same day, definitely on the following day. So the turnaround time for samples submitted to us is basically between 12 hours to 48 if there would be complications, and that's what we have maintained so far. At the moment, we have so far tested close to 200 um, samples, and as the Deputy Minister have, has indicated, only 14 um, cases have been found positive between both ourselves and the private laboratory pathcare we used to also test uh, before it has now been channeled all to, to NIP. Um, what I can say in terms of what is the new developments on the testing side is the fact that the technology we use currently, uh, it's technology that requires highly trained scientists because it has to be done partly manually and then partly through um, the machinery that we have. The good news is that new technology is coming on stream. Those of you who, um, those of you who are following um, news on, on, on COVID-19 would have realized that in the last week alone, a number of new um, reagents have been cleared within the US by the FDA and, and in Europe as well. Those technologies are becoming available to us and uh, we have already been able to source some of them and expect deliveries most probably by the end of, of, uh, of, of April. This will enable NIP to decentralize the testing that we, um, we are doing for COVID-19. So far, our testing has been centralized to the central laboratory in Vendok for the reasons I've stated. But once we start receiving um, these reagents that I've referred to, we'll be able to decentralize the testing to some of the major centers, uh, most probably at the beginning to Oshakati, which is our second biggest um, laboratory, and the, then to the coast, and then as the um, outbreak develops, we will definitely be able to um, decentralized testing to any number of, of districts in the country. 
which will make it possible for us to, to test cases as they come up without having to transport the samples from the various collection sites to Vandu. So that is good news. And also to say, the, because we have the machinery we have, it's machines that can also be used to test COVID-19, provided we get the right reagents. So we have machines in virtually all the, the districts of the country already that can be used to test uh, COVID-19. And once we have the reagents, and depending on how the disease is, is breaking out, we will be able to um, sequentially um, open up laboratories to, to test for, for COVID-19. Right now, we are testing in Venduk, and because of the numbers, we have been able to continue testing in the confines of Venduk. Um, but as the numbers grow, and as the disease breaks out in different parts of the country, we will be ready to conduct these tests. I think I'll stop there for now, Deputy Minister, and uh, I can take questions later. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uira, for that one. Um, I think the statements we have received are comprehensive enough. However, we are now opening up the floor for questions from any media personality here with us in the center. I would also like to remind um, the media personalities that we're using the mic um, to actually ask um, our questions so that um, the viewers at home can also hear our questions. I would also like to remind anyone who's not here, here at the center with us, that we have an email address that you can channel your questions to so that we're able to respond to them um, with regards to the needs of the panel. So if you're Giving your question before 12 o'clock every day will ensure that by the time the panelists um, give a brief, the brief update here at 4, they're able to factor in responses to any of those questions you might have. Um, the email address is covid.nam at mic.gov.na. That's covid.nam at mict.gov.na. So please, we implore you to rather channel the, your questions for those who are at home through that email so that any person that comes on the panel will be able to answer them and you don't have to, to come here physically. Uh, I'm now opening up the floor to any journalists who might have any questions with regards to presentations made here. We have one, two, three in that order for now, and four in that order for now. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, and Doctor, for the opportunity. My name is Kevin. I am a host at Eagle uh, 200 tests that we've carried out, that we've uh, carried so far. Uh, I would like to understand, uh, are we testing fast enough? Can you tell the Namibian, Namibians uh, if we are carrying out our tests as far, as fast as we're supposed to? And, uh, Experts in South Africa are talking about the calm before the storm right now. They are saying that it's just a matter of weeks before the situation they explode. We've been seeing exponential rise of cases. Do you think that uh, there is a potential of that spilling into Namibia? And my third question, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister, is what is the criteria for an individual Namibian to be tested? I'm asking this question because on radio, we have had people coming with allegations to say, I had what I suspect to be classical symptoms of the COVID-19, but simply because I couldn't tick two boxes. I had a flu, my lungs were locking up, I wasn't able to breathe, my situation continues to de deteriorate, but still Robert Mugabe Clinic is telling me that just go and isolate. Is it possible for one to just be tested for the sake of, uh, um, you know, to just have assurance? or you need to make sure that all the boxes are ticked as far as symptoms are concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give over to the panel um, to respond to that, some of those questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would also want to mention that um, in our midst we have our um, doctor from the clinical management team. So, and I want him also to feel free to answer some of these questions because they are the people who are on a daily basis dealing with these uh, issues. But um, I want to emphasize that 
it is very important that for any person, and that is what, what I have also been saying, that everyone who, ha who has a concern or who suspect that I might present symptoms should be assisted when they want to, 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 to be tested. Because we cannot just send people away because we and tell them to go and isolate. Of course, our isolation is also encouraged for people to, to remain self-isolated and after 14 days to see, because in some cases the test is also uh, not showing uh, immediately. But I'm sure that my doctor at the back, they might also want to come in. As far as the testing is concerned, we also have our doctor from NIP, and I'm sure he will also provide some answers. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister. I think Dr. Kachitai will probably want to talk about um, who qualifies to be tested. Because the, the criteria for, 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 for testing is something that is determined by the, by the team within the ministry that will, on an ongoing basis and with the guidance of WHO, determine um, who is to be tested. Um, are we testing fast enough? As I said, in NIP, what we have been doing is to test samples referred to us, and we have been able to test those that come to us on a daily basis and release the results every day. Um, and, but we do anticipate, just to answer your question halfway before Dr. Kachitai comes in, is to say, as you expect that there is a quiet before the storm, and that seems to have been shown in many of the countries that now already have the high numbers that we see and read about today. Yes, and that is for the very reason that NIP has been gearing itself and preparing for those large numbers that may be breaking out in the coming weeks or so. So that from the system that we have now, as we are testing, we are preparing different alternatives that will be enabling us to test uh, large numbers of people, including up to thousands per day. So, as a matter of fact, we are getting ready for when that need comes within the country. But as to who then qualifies to be tested, I think I will leave that to the colleagues from the, from the um, case management and the clinical side. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to respond to these questions. I'm Dr. Kashitai, I'm a specialist physician. I'm serving on the case management committee. Just, just to mention one thing, we are following guiding from WHO. There's a clear case definition which is actually coming there. And like, as, as most of you know, you, for you to be tested is, we are at the moment focusing on those individuals who are coming from overseas, who, had, who are coming from countries which have actually been affected by COVID. So that's the first thing, especially if they develop symptoms, then they will be tested. That's, and then the secondly, we are also focusing on those individuals who have been in contact with individuals who came from overseas, who have been symptomatic or who develop symptoms. The typical symptoms of the calf, the shortness of breath, uh, the shortness of breath, and obviously the fever. Those are the individuals where we are looking at that. And then on the other side, just like the case number 14, which has actually been mentioned, mm -hmm. health professionals who have been in contact with a patient who is actually coming again from overseas, who then develop symptoms like the fever, the calf, and the shortness of breath. And obviously also some, some, some of them are developing muscle aches and body ache. There is clear symptoms which are actually in that line. So this is generally the average of individuals who are there. At the moment we are speaking about local transmission like the case number 14, which I've just, which we mentioned, but we are not yet there at the stage of community transmission, which basically means that you've got someone in the community who cannot tell you how did he develop symptoms of fever and the calf, but he's clearly fulfilling the COVID symptomatic definition. 
those individuals who, at the moment we don't have anyone who has actually gone through that who has actually developed symptoms without telling us that he was in contact with someone who came overseas or someone who became symptomatic after coming in contact with someone who was actually overseas but yes we are also looking at the situation of reversing our criteria uh, we 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 have also started looking taking samples of individuals who are presenting themselves at the various hospitals who have symptoms which will fit in COVID but where there is no contact tracing or there is where there is no con there is no trace of someone who came from overseas we are looking at roundabout taking a sample of 40 individuals who are coming from the community and obviously hopefully by next week if we have got the results that will then guide us to tell us as to now that the epidemic has actually advanced to the stage where we need to look at every individual who is actually presenting themselves with symptoms. But what I could actually mention at the same time, Namibia has been dry for a long time. We had five years of drought. For a long time, we didn't have people with allergies, with asthma. In fact, some of the doctors have actually forgotten what are, what are these allergic conditions, asthma in this year. And then now, all of a sudden, we are seeing patients who are presenting with shortness of breath, with cough, and all sorts of throat irritations, which are actually directly related to the allergic conditions. And they are coming much more to the fore. Very often, I'm also asked to go to the hospital and look at this person, whether he fulfills case definition. And what I've so far picked up with a lot of these patients who are coming in the hospital is they are presenting themselves with allergic conditions because of the good rainfalls which we had and the green environment which is there which is obviously triggering the asthma symptoms the other side is also that the change of weather is also making a lot of people to sneeze and to develop flu symptoms which are almost the same as the covid and that's the reason why we are not testing everyone the other question was actually that we don't have we haven't we have so far not been having enough test kits even overseas the places where these test kits have been produced they don't have enough to have been in the situation where they could actually test everyone so we are really guided by who but maybe the time will also come where we will be able to test people we are as dr Wirap have actually mentioned we are in the process of actually sourcing more test kits and also for looking for other simpler alternatives but generally if you ask me as a clinician what is my impression we've also been i've also been following this this thing for quite a long time if you look at the epidemic or the pandemic in various countries we know that the numbers double almost every second day we can talk i mean i can I, I can gladly talk about that. This is now around about our second week, 14 days since we diagnosed the first cases. And what we have done so far is actually to really contain this condition. Dr. Wirab is actually talking about 200 tests which we have conducted where we have got around about 14. I think I need to be corrected. If we look at what was done completely in the country, we are talking about around about 260 to 270 tests which have actually been done here in Namibia and if we look at 14 cases being done on people who had symptoms of COVID I mean or symptoms which could suggest COVID then if you look at those 14 individuals compared to the 260 we have done relatively well we've been able to successfully contain that yes it's been a bit of a discomfort to many people who have actually been put in quarantine isolation units but it's somehow to me proving that this is actually bearing fruit and what we need to do is actually at all cost try to contain this condition keep it outside the hospitals we don't want to get into the hospitals where we see the situation like in the uk or in the usa or in spain because once it gets into the hospital then it becomes a bit of a difficult thing mm. and this that's the reason why we are doing what we are doing mm. thank, thank you. you thank you very much doctor for that very deeply insightful 
um, response to testing and our capacity to test and um, the question around who really actually qualifies for testing. We move on to our second question. Um, Ma'am, the floor is yours. Um, quick one, and we get responses. Thank you. So I wanted to find out perhaps how many of these machines are we going to acquire and perhaps uh, how much will it cost. And um, my other question then goes to uh, the Deputy Minister of Health. Uh, we are aware that uh, of course shopping malls are closed and we are also aware that most uh, expectant mothers, they will buy clothes for example from Pep Ackermans, but of course these shops are closed so perhaps what will then happen to these expectant mothers? Where will they get clothes? Is the ministry going to help them? Of course, we're talking about health issues here and combating, of course, the spread of the virus, but what will then happen in this case? Thank you. Shall I go first? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's true that most of the shops are closed and uh, people should also remember that we are in a state of emergency, so things are not as usual. And um, I know that many of the shops now, people can also order whatever they need online or they can call. Many of them have provided numbers where people can call. So I think in that case, that could be a possibility that can be explored with most of the shops. I know many of them like uh, Spa, for example, where people can also order online or through the telephone and then they deliver and as they deliver people pay cash and I think that is also the same that can be arranged with many other shops as well. Um, yeah, ma'am, thanks for the question. Maybe before I answer the question also just to say the 200 tests I talked about is what NIP has done. As you will recall, uh, the Minister of Health actually announced, I think yesterday, that the combined testing um, for Namibians is over 300 already, but, but the 200 that I'm referring to is what NIP has done specifically. Um, how many machines are we looking at buying or have we bought and how much do they cost? Well, um, as I said earlier, most of the machines we're talking about, we already have in NIP because these machines are not specifically only for COVID. We are using them for TB, for HIV, and so on, because that is what the technology is. What we need for specifically for, for COVID are the reagents that are used on, on these same machines to test for COVID. And so when we do need additional machines, like we're now considering one additional one for Shakati, the upgraded versions that will work faster, we have long since stopped buying. We are leasing them from companies, so we don't really um, even go and spend a lot of money. Because if you buy, you sit with, a, with an old piece, but if you lease, you are able to get new upgrades as, as the companies manufacture new ones. So to say we are gearing ourselves geographically in the country, and as I said, Venduk is now enabled we'll be looking at Oshakati, we'll be looking at the coast, and then we'll be watching how the disease is, is progressing. We will then be looking at the far northeast, um, at, at Katima Mulilo, Rundu, we'll be looking at Kietmansuop, Ochivarongo, Unanjoko, and so on. So for us, it's a matter of um, working with the ministry to see how the disease is breaking out. But, but that is our idea, is to say, we have centralized now when it was needed, but we are gearing ourselves for um, going out to the areas as, as, as the need arises. Maybe I can add, the, if I may, um, on the, the, the samples taken of the suspected COVID-19 cases, uh, it's not only NIP, because we also have PathCare. And uh, I know that um, 156 samples were submitted to Pathcare as well. 
that they intend to send to South Africa and we are still waiting for that. So I just wanted to add that it's not only NIP but we also have Pathcare. Thank you very much for those responses. We have two more questions. Um, the lady over here and then the lady over there and then we wrap it up for today. Good afternoon. My name is Merica from NBC. Uh, my question is, when we have a COVID-19 funeral, how will the state handle that? And to what extent will the family be involved in the arrangements? Thank you. Okay. Um, any COVID-19 related death is handled by the state. Uh, it's like in cases of Ebola and many others, because yeah. even if the body is, is, is dead, it is still infectious. So that is being dealt by the, by the state. That is also to protect family members and the community at large. Um, good afternoon, my name is Shamin Gashihewe from the Namibian newspaper. I have about three questions, but I wanted to confirm with Dr. Wirap, how many testing machines are there? I don't know if I, I don't think you answered that. Um, and then, basically on the permit issue, um, some businesses are struggling to get hold of the trade ministry to, like on the online version to apply for permit. So how is that working? And maybe also since the regulations apply um, countrywide, how are people in the region supposed to apply for their permits? And then I wanted to find out, in terms of, for the Ministry of Health, um, in terms of health workers um, who have come in contact with COVID-19 patients, are they being quarantined away from their family as well, or maybe basically isolated from their family? I mean, we have this case of the uh, 14th case that has uh, contracted the virus. So um, are the health uh, workers basically away, isolated, and then like in a different center away from home. And then the family of this health worker that has contracted the virus, um, are they also isolated? Are they being tested as well? Or have they been tested? Is it underway perhaps? And then lastly, confirmation, I understand that there is a COVID-19 patient at Eros Airport. I just wanted to confirm, or someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Thank you. <laughs> at Eros Airport, uh, I'm not, sure about that one. We know that uh, we have facilities at the international airport where we have some people who are in quarantining there. And um, for the health uh, professionals who are on a daily basis in contact with um, COVID-19 patients, we have made arrangements, the ministry have made arrangements for them not to go back to their families or to their homes so we have uh, some facilities in, in town, like guest houses, where they go and uh, isolate themselves there because we don't want them to go and, you know, mingle with their family members. So they, that is taken care of. Um, okay, if I may quickly answer the question of how many machines. Maybe I should give the specifics that you want to hear. Right now, we have a machine at Venduk Central, um, Venduk Central Laboratory that is called the Light Cycler 480. Perhaps you need that. And that's the one that is the conventional PCR machine that we have been using. We have over 40 gene expert machines within NIP in different laboratories in the country. The Ministry of Health itself has 15 G gene expert machines. So in terms of testing capacity, we have more than enough capacity because the reagents have now become available to use the machinery that we have. So previously we were restricted to what was available internationally for reagents for COVID-19, which could only be used at this particular one machine. Now, because the new reagents for the gene expert machines that we already have in the country being used now for HIV and for TB, we are now sourcing the reagents for the gene expert uh, so that we can be able to decentralize. In addition, new um, 
technology became available that only last Friday were being announced by the Americans for machines that we also have within, within NIP already, which um, will, also, will also be able to source additional reagents. And that is the machine that is going to revolutionize the, te the testing because one machine can test um, about 450 uh, patients per day. We have two of them and we have now just secured one for Oshakati. So literally only those three machines will literally be able to test for you close to 1,500 when the need arises. Plus the gene experts that are there. Although we have them in every district, we are not intending to test in all the districts because remember, this is an infectious agent we are talking about. So we will need to branch out with caution as we prepare the bigger centers that we have to be able to test for all of those various towns around them. Um, but the capacity is there and we have said for now we will be looking at Vanduk and Oshakati, we will be moving to Wallfish Bay S3 and that is where we are going to stop. And then we will see what is it that we are going to do as the, the condition or the, the outbreak intensifies. If the chair will allow me just for one minute quickly, um, a number of journalists have asked about rapid testing. The rapid tests are testing for antibodies that the body forms against the invading virus. Meaning therefore, right at the beginning, the body does not have antibodies and it will take a few days before the antibodies are, able, are detected. So for the purposes of diagnosing somebody with COVID-19 at the beginning, we are not anticipating to use the rapid test. But people who are now admitted or, or isolated and who will be released to say they have recovered, there before, before they are sent out, we will be looking to use the rapid test in those kind of circumstances. So rapid tests have their own function, but we have not been using them up to this point because of the reason I've explained. Uh, Thank you, Chair. With regard to the <coughs> terms from the Ministry of Trade, it is not just a telephone number. There were also emails that were provided and they were shown on NBC about five or even six. So people will tell them to keep watching news. Perhaps NBC is going to repeat that. So and the Ministry of Trade and industry is in a position when contacted to advise those that are outside the window to inform them how they are going to get their payments. So let people, if the phone is not working or is engaged at that particular time, they can also communicate via those emails that were provided. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those responses. Maybe just to add to uh, Honorable Bear's response on the permits, uh, tomorrow the Deputy Executive Director of the Ministry of Trade will join us at 10 o'clock in the morning to just clarify some of the queries. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we are moving closer to the end of our program. I ha ever have one task um, to do, which is to respond to some questions we received by email. Like I said, um, should you send your questions via email, we'll definitely respond to them. But before that, I'd also like to recognize the presence of our Vice President, uh, His Excellency Dr. Nangolom Pumba, who is here to join us today to really just observe today's proceedings. Therefore, I'd like to move on to the questions that were sent to the email, which is covid.num at micd.gov.na um, that we would like now to respond to. The first question reads as follows. We would like to see confirmation that all returning travelers via beta post will be quarantined at Chaka Beno. The answer is yes, all returning Namibian citizens and permanent residence holders and any such persons granted entry into the country in terms of the state emergency COVID-19 regulation 7 will undergo a mandatory 14 days supervised quarantine at the Ben Hu Rural Development Center in Chaka Benu and at the Youth Center at Ella Duplessis. 
at, no, at the, in the youth center at Duplessis Plus. The next question is, what arrangements are in place to educate and supply soap and sanitizers to the community of Chaka? Community education is done by health official, officials, says the response, through distribution of booklets in different languages in collaboration with the Kalahari Constituency Councillor's Office. The ministry has no soaps or sanitizers to provide to the public, but encourage public members to buy themselves soaps and regularly wash their hands. Provisions of soaps or sanitizers is made for persons quarantined and security forces at the quarantine facility. The third question is, how will the people on quarantine be fed and contained in their place to ensure that they do not come out? The answer is, people under supervised quarantine in terms of the state of emergency COVID-19 regulation 8 will be given food rations from the Ben Hu Center and, al and alternatively from the Khobabas District Hospital. The Namibian police will be at the center to enforce the supervised quarantine in terms of the state of emergency COVID-99 regulation 15 that states that no person under supervised quarantine will come out of the quarantine facility before the end of the period of 14 days has lapsed. The fourth question is, the Republic of South Africa has its has at this moment the highest incidences of COVID-19 on the continent. To what, it, to what health facilities will the persons who test positive be taken to? The isolation facility in Khobaba says the response is ready to isolate up to five patients that will test positive to COVID-19. The last question from this particular uh, list of questions is, the community of Chaka is worried about the health of the community. They propose that it should not be placed directly in the community, but rather outside, such as where the road construction site was in Chaka. And this is re reference to the uh, quarantine facility. The response, however, is the use of the Benu Rural Development uh, Center as a qu quarantine facility poses no threat to the health of the community in Chaka, as the persons that will be quarantined there will not be in contact with the community members. And then finally, there's a question on health workers. The question is, is government going to consider releasing some of the health workers into the communities to reach out to the minorities and the vulnerable to reach out to those without? The response is, the government has plans in place to reach the vulnerable and the minority members of our society. This undertaking has, undertaking has been done jointly with stakeholders. At regional level, our officials, this in reference to the Minister of Health and Social Services, have identified those vulnerable groups and put measures in place to protect them. Example, in recent days, through the collaboration of the City of Winduk and the Ministry of Gender and Social Welfare, as well as the Ministry of Youth. I would like to end there and also give an announcement that um, all travel permits are issued by the regional councillors at the different constituency offices. Therefore, for those who need to to get travel permits should go to their respective constituency offices to be able to be issued with those permits. I would like now to give over to the panel one or two minutes concluding remarks before we close off today's segment. Yes, I would like to repeat what I said yesterday, that uh, our ministry is busy translating the leaflets. They will be dispatched to the regions by Monday the latest. We hope to complete the process over this weekend. And also to caution those that are spreading fake news to desist from that because we are dealing with a serious issue here. For example, there was another fake news going around today that the president has opened some liquor uh, shops for three days, allowed to operate for three days. These are fake news and only information that is coming from this center is an authentic information from the government. Thank you. From my side, um, I want to, on the question of uh, COVID-19 barriers, I want to respond on that one and say that at the moment I have to say that we are still lucky because we don't have any COVID-19 related death. It's zero at the moment. And uh, we really hope and pray that uh, we will keep it there. But to the 
community out there, it's, it's one just want to emphasize over and over again that uh, this is a pandemic which is affecting everyone, every sector of our communities, and uh, we really want to encourage people to adhere to the rules because that's the only way that how we can prevent further spreading of this um, virus. So, and I want to encourage people also to make use of this center. You know, whenever they have questions, they can go through the, the email that has been provided and, you know, put themselves at, 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 at ease. And lastly, um, for the people in the community, I know that um, to be confined in a house can also pose its own challenges. People are becoming anxious, they are becoming irritated because they have to isolate and so on. But they can still find ways to cope. They can start doing exercising and, and all these kind of things. And uh, in times like this, it's when we really make use of our um, innovative and creative thinking and come up with things that will not bore people at home so that at the end of this day we also have to start dealing with other issues that are affecting um, families such as gender-based violence. So, and I'm, I'm confident that if we all put our hands together and we collaborate, we will be in a better position to deal with this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I will definitely concur with, with my seniors on the call to the Namibian uh, nation and the public at large to cooperate with the measures that are being put in place. After all, it is being done for our own health and our own future. Um, I want to then also say, apart from the ministry and the international organizations I have mentioned that they have provided support to NIP, I must also say there has been a lot of um, offers from the business sector in Namibia, um, offering various things that how could they assist us to be able to better um, set ourselves up mm. to, 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 to test and, and provide the results um, in time. So I wish to really express our gratitude for all the support that we continue to, re uh, to, to receive and also call on those others who perhaps so far have not come out to to, to make their contribution as business personalities or business people to also think along those lines. I think if all of us give the support that is required, I think um, we should be able to keep COVID-19 under control and hopefully not lose lives as the deputy has said that we can keep it the way we have so far. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all those that joined in today. We thank the Vice President, Honorable Ministers, Deputies, Dr. Irap, and all those that are here at COVID-19 Communication Center, and especially our viewers at home for making the time to tune in. Please get us again tomorrow at 10 a.m. as we give you more updates about COVID-19 and all its sectoral impacts in Namibia. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gomez. Vice President, for having us. Actually, we have been able to get the necessary supplies and we continue to test all those that have been submitted to us so far are being tested. We can say that and we have been able to do that specimen or samples that are submitted to us and that's what we have maintained so far. At the moment, we have so far tested close to 200 um, samples and as the Deputy Minister have, has indicated, only 14 um, cases have been found positive between both ourselves 
and the private laboratory Patke who used to also test uh, before it has now been channeled all to, to NIP. Um, what I can say in terms of what is the new development on the testing side is the fact that the technology we use currently uh, it's technology that requires highly trained scientists because it has to be done partly manually and then partly through um, the machinery that we have. The good news is that new technology is coming on stream. Those of you who, um, those of you who are following um, news on, on, on COVID-19 would have realized that in the last week alone, a number of new um, reagents have been cleared within the US by the FDA and, and in Europe as well. Those technologies are becoming available to us and uh, we have already been able to source some of them and expect deliveries most probably by the end of, of, uh, of, of April. This will enable NIP to decentralize the testing that we, um, we are doing for COVID-19. So far, our testing has been centralized to the central laboratory in Vanduk for the reasons I've stated. But once we start receiving um, these reagents that I've referred to, we'll be able to decentralize the testing to some of the major centers, uh, most probably at the beginning to Oshakati, which is our second biggest um, laboratory, and then, then to the coast, and then as the um, outbreak develops, we will definitely be able to um, decentralize testing to any number of, of districts in the country, which will make it possible for us to, to test cases as they come up without having to transport the samples from the various collection sites to Vandu. So that is good news. And also to say, the, because we have the machinery we have, it's machines that can also be used to test COVID-19, provided we get the right reagents. So we have machines in virtually all the, the districts of the country already that can be used to test COVID-19. And once we have the reagents, and depending on how the disease is, is breaking out, we will be able to um, sequentially um, open up laboratories to, to test for, for COVID-19. Right? For this case definition, and what I've so far picked up with a lot of these patients who are coming in the hospital is they are presenting themselves with allergic conditions because of the good rainfalls which we had and the green environment which is there, which is obviously triggering the asthma symptoms. The other side is also. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You have just witnessed uh, the afternoon briefing where um, Minister Pewa Mushilenga, uh, Dr. Dave Urap, CEO of NIP, and uh, Deputy Health Minister Esther Murangare uh, spoke a bit about the modalities that uh, they put in place to deal with the uh, testing and also the isolation of patients who have tested positive. Thank you so much for joining in our stream this afternoon and we hope to see you again tomorrow for more information. Uh, we understand 10 o'clock tomorrow there will be another briefing and uh, as well as 4 o'clock. So please stay tuned and stay safe. Thank you.
Guys, anybody deserves high fives in this room? Yes. But you have to go to the mall. There's no tomorrow. There is tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good.